Hi, everybody. I have to go through the bed to get up to you. Oh, I stepped on something. Oh, my goodness. Hi. This is my sound recorder. Woo. I'm going to just get comfortable because <sighs> I have a lot to talk about today. I hope everybody's doing good. Hi, everybody. Welcome to podcast number three. Let me just get situated. I just spilled coffee everywhere. Where should I put this? Hmm. Put that there. Okay. <clears throat> my heart is going a million miles an hour right now. Check my hair. It's stressful doing a podcast. <laughs> it's like there's a lot to think about. So, hi everybody. It's Maggie. You know who I am, hopefully. Um, and I'm in Kenya. I'm in Kenya, Africa. Nairobi. Nairobi, Kenya, in Africa. And it is amazing. I mean, I'm only one day in, okay? So I don't totally know how amazing Africa is, but I will tell you a few stories today about my travels this year and how I ended up here. So also, I feel like I'm kind of lisping a little bit. I don't know what's going on with my jaw, but I'm going to just try my best. I feel like there's um, some kind of blockage in my mouth. I don't know where or why, but I was looking at my teeth today on this side, and on the bottom, they're sort of like angling in more than usual, even though I wear, I have this thing called, um, well, it's called like Brux, Bruxum or something. I don't know what the actual name is, okay, but it's a term that means you grind your teeth really, really bad in the night. So I've basically been doing this since I was young, and my teeth started to crack, like little micro cracks. So I have to wear, I've had to have like a lot of um, work done on them because of just like gnashing and gnashing. And I had braces on the bottom uh, teeth a couple years ago. And then ever since then, I don't know my, my um, the way I talk has been a little off. And you might not even notice it. You probably won't, actually. You know, we always tend to like compare ourselves to other people. So you're probably thinking, oh, no, you know, it, it's fine. It sounds fine compared to whatever, myself or so-and-so. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's weird. Um, it's weird. Anyway, so I'm sort of becoming aware of my own voice more now that I have this podcast and I've been talking and it's sort of like I'm talking for a living now. I started to take a public speaking class and I also became very aware of how I talk and what I sound like and how my mouth moves and it's just like a new thing that's been coming up. So anyway, I'll move on. Um, let's see. I'm in Kenya, and this is podcast number three. You're watching Why Be Lamron, which is my take on talking about things that are normal and things that aren't normal to me. And I love the word Lamron because it's normal spelled backwards. And my friend Julia, back in fifth grade, had this T-shirt that she wrote. Or she had a T-shirt that said Why Be Lamron on it. I never forgot it. So I named the podcast this. And we're on episode three. Um, I want to thanks thank a few people for watching and for commenting. Uh, it's been fun actually so far to see who's actually like listened and interacted with me a little bit. So thank you for the viewers. One guy said on my last podcast, which was so cool. I just want to give a shout out to you um, that he found my podcast through my Christian deconversion video, which I did with this amazing journalist and uh, YouTuber, Aaron Janice. Um, and you'll have to check it out. Actually, okay, I know I'm going a million miles an hour, but today is the one year anniversary of us uploading this one hour video where the two of us talk about how we left Christianity. I left Christianity 12 years ago. And I grew up in it basically my whole life. And I, I give my story. And I realize after, after doing that video and after actually analyzing my life and what I, was, uh, what I grew up believing, um, how much of that informed the decisions I've made in my life and who I am today. And not all in a positive way. I mean, there's so many subtle nuances to to just my way of thinking that I'm trying to actually break out of. Um, there's so many little consequences that came from growing up in, um, in a bubble of Christianity we talk about that, that I notice about myself today 
and I've have to having to unlearn a lot of ways of being that I have. So please check out the video. But anyway, okay, this is what I wanted to say. It's our one year anniversary of uploading it. We uploaded on um, on October 22nd, um, a year ago, and it now has 20,000 views. So on t today, so today it got its 20,000th view, uh, apps, uh, one year later. So I thought that was kind of weird, a little weird, right? Like uh, to the day we get our 20,000th view. So check it out. It's in my playlist on my on my um, YouTube station, and I'll you can check out Aaron's station, which is called Questioning the Narrative. So thanks for doing that. I'm just like holding my coffee here, but I think the reason I'm going a million miles an hour is that I had this instant coffee today, and I don't know what was in it. And I think sometimes when I have like instant coffee from a different country, uh, it's just like different ingredients or something. I remember I was living in Qatar about a decade ago and I was hooked on these little packets of instant coffee supposedly and then I realized they were making my heart like go a million miles an hour and we looked and there was an ingredient in them I don't know even what it was but it turns out it was like not good for you at all it was like an equivalent of of some kind of weird chemical that I don't know it was a weird chemical so I'm just we are just chemical reactions aren't we a lot of what we are is how our body is responding to the things we put in it and our environment and the stimulus that's happening all around us. So the older I get, the more I realize that, and it's weird. Um, okay, so speaking of chemical reactions and the stimuli around us, I'll tell you what's been happening with me besides drinking this weird coffee. Um, so I'm in an Airbnb, and you can't, you know what? I'll show you. I'll do a video in a little bit about the chaos that I've created in this Airbnb. And I've been thinking a lot about chaos. And chaos versus stability, or what's another word for um, stability? Uh, order. Chaos versus order. And I feel like in my life, I have been trying to find a balance between the two. Because I have always been a bit of a chaotic person. I like, I've been messy my whole life, and I, I'm trying to get a hold of that. I know there's books to read on being messy, and I've tried reading blogs and putting things into practice, but it hasn't helped yet. So I got this book at the airport, the Qatar airport. Jordan Peterson. Hey, Jordan. Jordan, I hope you watch my station someday. I really like you. Uh, I met or I met Jordan. I met Jordan online about <clears throat> uh, six months ago, and he's a psychology. I think like a clinical psychologist that studies at the University of Toronto, and he writes books and does lectures on on how to be your best self, basically, and human nature and what's going on scientifically in our bodies and with our ways of being and how we can interact better with each other by knowing ourselves better. I like Jordan's way, his approach is really down to earth and he's just easy to listen to. So check out Jordan Peterson, you obviously probably know who he is. But I bought this book and I started reading it. I'm only in chapter one, okay? So I'm gonna make some comments about this book today. I know it's only chapter one, but it's, it's relevant to what I wanna talk about. <clears throat> Uh, he calls this the 12 rules for life, an antidote to chaos. And I'm thinking, oh, chaos, that's what I need an antidote to. So I get to the first, let me get to the first chapter because I have a note in here. Um, basically, he's talking, it's called Stand Up Straight with Your Shoulders Back. And he gives an analogy which was really nice to lobsters and how lobsters have been around for like millions of years and the dominant the what the lobster when they're fighting the the one that um wins is the one that is respected more basically so the lobster that kind of gives in and doesn't stand up for himself or herself keeps on getting um less of the resources and the one that kind of 
wins the fight gets more resources. And I'm not actually even explaining that right, but what I realized about about this book and the first antidote to chaos, but I was thinking about this. Okay, I'm back up. Forget the lobster thing because I don't want to actually go there quite yet, but what Jordan's theme is in this book is us riding the line between order and chaos. And I got to thinking about my own life and what, see, here I go, like, I got to thinking about my own life and the things in it that are stable and the things in it that are unstable. Okay, so the stable things are having a job that has money coming in regularly. To me, because I was born in the United States, it's living close to my family somewhere. Actually, stability feels like living in my home country. When I'm traveling, it's a bit of unstable. And I do like that, but I still feel like I'm all over the place when I'm traveling, even though the chaos of travel gives me new experiences and mm, I feel like I'm all over the place right now. I think I'm going to pause and try to get myself together because my thoughts are just not really coming clearly right now. I think I'm going to meditate, actually. I'm going to meditate and try to get my thoughts together. So I will be back. I'm going to shut the camera off. I'm sorry that was all over the place. I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't really know what the deal is in my head, but there's so many thoughts coming so fast right now, and I don't have the words to actually get out what I want to say. So I'm going to pause, and I'll come back and see you in a few minutes. I turned on the camera. Okay, let me sit down first. I turned on the camera quicker than I normally would have because I thought I would meditate with you. I'm going to actually uh, show you what I do, and maybe if you want to do this with me, you can. Put a pillow here. Um, okay, so I cross my legs. I like to sit on something where there's a back so I can sit up nice and straight. I'm going to close my eyes. Some people can put your hands gently in your lap. Others can put your palms up or down. I'm gonna grab the recorder because I want you to hear what I'm doing with my breath. I'm inhaling and exhaling out my nose, but I'm letting the sound come uh, be strongest in the back of my throat. So it's called a little bit of ujjayi breath in yoga. You don't really need ujjayi breath in meditation, but sometimes, sorry, sometimes I like to put a little ujjayi breath in, in my meditation, which is just deep breathing in the nose and out the nose, but you hear it in the back of your throat. So it sounds like this. It's like Darth Vader breath. So inhale. Relax the shoulders and exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Okay, let's just sit here for a minute. You can fast forward if you're bored. I understand that. Kind of random. I'm gonna put my hands in the lap. The idea in meditation is that you observe the thoughts that come into your head 
I call, I say like clouds, because one of my yoga teachers said that one time. Observe the thoughts and then watch them go. So watch the thoughts come and watch the thoughts go. So all meditation is, is basically breathing, sitting still in whatever comfortable position is good for you. Some people like to really use, use their core to like sit up nice and straight. Some people drop their shoulders, even, even um, establish a stance that's sort of uh, like, stra like straight arms with, with um, fingers like this and three straight three straight fingers, but it's not necessary. Oh, look at my, my bracelet says Kenya. I just noticed that. I mean, I knew it said Kenya, but I forgot I had it on. Um, so there's different styles of how you can, how you can sit that's most comfortable for you. But like I said, just find a place that's comfortable, close your eyes, breathe, and watch your thoughts. And we'll do this for a few minutes because I need to calm down.
Hello, I'm back. How are you? Did anybody do that with me? I'm really curious if you, you did. Please comment below if you meditated with me just now. I really want to know what your experience was like. For me, the thoughts still raced. A few thoughts I had were, were what am I going to talk about next? I feel, I felt some fear about aging and I've been thinking a lot about the body decaying and losing my mind actually because as I well, when I hit 41 in September, I had a few, I had a moment actually. It was really strange. It happened in Greece. And I've had a lot of different relationships swirling around me for a while. You know, past lovers, you know, people that I have been intimate with, but then it didn't work out long term but we're still friends. People that I loved very much that aren't in my life anymore. Um, new people coming in that I'm trying to understand their role. Um, a lot, there's maybe like my, my family and the changing relationship with my parents as I age and as I see them more as people with their own set of flaws and their own limitations based on where they grew up, the time in which they grew up, their uh, education, their, you know, the, the people they put around them, their beliefs. You know, I, I've been thinking a lot about, about these relationships all kind of around me and then I had a moment when I was in Athens I was staying with this lady I talk about it a little bit in my second podcast and what happened was it was like this flood of understanding but it was like instant and I understood I understood about five different people in my life and where they were coming from it was like this empathetic moment 
where I knew I could feel what they were going through. Maybe not to the extent, obviously, that they are going through it, but I could feel why, I could f- understand why they acted or did the, the things to me, you know, to me like hurt me or left me or said this or this is why our relationship is within this container and it's not more why there's limitations on what I can discuss with them how close I feel to them I understood it like in a moment and it at the end of the moment it came like a tidal wave I felt so much love for them it was like this moment of complete forgiveness and it's like sorry it's like it, it, it's like um there's not words to actually say I didn't have words it's not something like that I can discuss and call them up and be like hey mom I understand why we're not closer or hey you know Danny who is, a, is somebody that I, I love very much and our relationship has changed a lot uh and we don't talk as much as we, I don't feel as close to him anymore. You know, he's got a new relationship and I did a lot of things that messed, messed it up. What could have been. But I, I understood a little bit more about like what their side of the story was. And it was really cool. It just was like, I don't know how that happened or what that it was even about, but it happened. And I'm going to just check myself. In. <laughs> um, so... I don't really know what's going to happen in the world, in my life. The, the world feels really scary sometimes. And I had this week last week. I'll tell you a little bit about that because it was, it was one of the most intense and dark weeks I've ever had. And I did not know what was going on in my body. And it was really scary and I was very far away from home. I was in Denmark last week. I accepted this uh, this role to come and work with an animal rights political party in Denmark because I met two beautiful amazing women at an animal rights conference in Portugal and being the person that I am for better or worse I said yes because I like an adventure so we're talking about chaos an adventure has a bit of chaos to it because you don't really know what's in store I could have gone home to the US uh, finished up a few projects that I'm already working on and went back to my my one bedroom my little one bedroom room that I rent out and started getting into yoga again which I do a couple times a week and I felt like I needed that in a way my my soul was telling me Maggie Maggie maybe you should go back to the US and get a routine again because I've been traveling at this traveling film festival in Italy that is is an example of chaos itself because you're going to one different city a week you're traveling with a hundred people from around the world making short films but it is the most beautiful chaos you can even imagine because you meet so many people you get you 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 have this understand you get a new perspective from all these people that you meet and then you're collaborating on ideas and having to work together in, in a country where most people that are there aren't speaking the language and the people, these small little Italian villages that we go to are so filled with loving people that want to bring you in and help you with your projects, be your actors. So it's like, the, it's a genius idea this man Frank Arena had 17 years ago and I love this festival, but it's, it is about chaos. It's, uh, it's, the order and you're you're living on a gym floor where there's no separation from other people you don't have your own bedroom it's like gets dirty at times because because you're you're like living yeah on a gym floor and then you are making films but like half the time you can't find electricity or you're editing like with all these plugs everywhere and you've piled up, you know, clothes to put your laptop on so you can edit. I mean, it gets crazy. So, but at the same time, like I said, chaos. And I feel like when I am in in a little bit of chaos, I'm closer to my animal nature of 
of connecting with other animals and learning from people that have nothing to do with the identity that I have created in the country where I was born and the job that I am used to. I am outside of my comfort zone. So I am alive. When I am at Cinema de Mare, this Italian film festival, it's a three month film festival, I am so alive feeling because it's like raw. I'm, we're almost outside of society we are outside of society in a way because we're all just living together, making films, living on a gym floor, and then going to another city and showing these films in the town square. And it's so beautiful. So I, I was in this for about a month and a half. And then I went to Portugal to, to uh, actually then I followed a guy for a weekend to London, a guy that I made out with and I thought that I, I liked him. I knew that like long term it wasn't going anywhere, but he was cute, he's an actor, he's funny. So he invited me to his house. And I thought, yeah, okay, this is gonna be fun. And if I'm being totally honest about it, I knew that I shouldn't have gone because I was going because it was a free place to stay. I, the other alternative would have been get an Airbnb in London for a few days because there was this like camp out thing that I wanted to go to, but I had a few days in between. So I decide, okay, I'm gonna take the adventure in lieu of something that could be more orderly or more normal to do. I'll just like see where this goes with this guy. And while I get there and we end up hooking up, which I wasn't really wanting to do, but it was, you know, I realized that I start to get a little turned on and I think, okay, well this, why not? You know, we might as well, which doesn't always work out great. I'm trying to change this part of me. Um, so we're not compatible when we, when we were together. And I think I didn't like the way he smelled. It's not, it's just like, I, when we were really close, it wasn't even a bad smell. It was just like not something that turned me on. So that happened. And then the next time he wanted to, and I made up an excuse like I was tired. And I wasn't really like loving his body once I was that physically close to him either. And I think I g sort of gave in the second time because I felt like I'm staying in his house and you know we already did it once so maybe it's not going to be a big deal to do it twice and I did and then I felt bad afterward I didn't feel closer because the conversation afterward and even like in general during the day was not flowing in the way where I was felt connected to this person there's nothing wrong about them but they they, they're an actor and they are kind of working they have their own shit going on you know like trying to figure out how to make money where they should go next you know dealing with problems and with landlords and roommates and all that stuff and like I have my own shit also which is you know I'm working for a political party in the US but trying to rethink my entire strategy of what is best to to raise awareness about what happens to animals I want to bring more love into my life for people but just dealing with my own anger issues really uh, I have my own money issues you know I'm traveling spending way more than I thought I was going to trying to find a way to make money remotely you know so I, I've got my issues he's got his issues again I talked about this in podcasts too and then you come together and I wanted a little bit of an adventure I think he wanted an adventure too probably to get laid you know why not this is like the fun part of life is is these uncertain uncertain and fun moments you know that we have so I get there against my better judgment knowing that he didn't really like the person that I was and, and we start to be like a little passive aggressive with each other because he wanted to you know do something that I didn't want to do uh, and so after we hooked up and then the next time I said no and then I said okay and then the next time I made up another excuse I was there for like four days we are going out we decide we want to go to dinner and he's I'm vegan he's not and he wanted to kind of show me. We're trying to like make up for it, for the fact that we're not compatible by us 
being um, drinking more, right? So it's sort of like, well, if we're not compatible, let's have drinks and we'll kind of try to build a little bit of hype around us, which means like, you know, let's go to a loud bar or let's get distracted. Let's go to a, a play or a cinema or something, anything so we don't have to actually be alone together and face the fact that we're not compatible because <laughs> we're kind of stuck now. He committed to let me stay. I didn't, you know, arrange another place. We didn't even have the conversation like, hey, dude, maybe we shouldn't have done this, but let's just make the best of our time together. That would have been the adult thing for us to do. would have just like sat down and said, okay, well, how do you feel about me? How do I feel about you? Because I could tell that he was not feeling me either. We, we weren't getting along. So instead, we go out, we try to explore London together. And, you know, I'll give him this, this credit because I don't think he could pretend for too, too long that he didn't really like me <laughs> because we're on our way to dinner and I really wanted to go to Earthling Ed's place. Earthling Ed is an activist in London and he opened a fish fry place and he wanted to take me to some place that was um, totally different. I don't know, not not that place. And so I expressed I'd like to go here and then he, he just completely, uh, we went to a cemetery and in the cemetery he said he wanted to find the grave of a poet that was there and recite a poem because that would be something that was special to him. And I'm thinking, okay, like, he's he's in his 20s here. <laughs> he's in his 20s. So, like, first, first problem, okay? Like, yeah, going and reciting a poem and, like, making a whole performance of this in your 20s is kind of fun. But when you're 41 and you're kind of in the back of your mind, you're, you're trying to, like, figure out why you make such bad decisions about guys like this is the last thing you want to do I was just hungry right so but I'm gonna amuse him and say oh that sounds fun okay yeah 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 let's do this but even though I was not having fun I was not like about this so we go to this cemetery we find this grave he starts reciting this poem then it was kind of fun for a minute so I pull out my phone and I'm like, oh, this sounds like, I was like, oh, I'll record you doing this. You know, not even to, to share on my social media. I didn't even want to, like, tell people who I was with or anything. I like to keep things private. But to, like, have it. And at the end, he, he messed up the poem. And he blew up at me. And he said that the reason he messed up the poem was because I started to record him. And I felt really stupid at that moment. Like, like why would you, I felt like, to myself like oh I'm stupid to w want to record this I'm like one of those people that's always trying to like record everything you know like how dumb are you so I respond by being defensive about that and saying like oh well you know I thought it'd be cool for, for you to have a video of that and then he starts saying like everybody can't we just be in the moment Maggie can't you just like live and that made me further feel stupid so I kind of walk off a little bit, and I'm like, fine, let's just go to dinner, you know? And then real, almost immediately after that, he's like, he's like, I have to tell you something. I'm in love with this other girl that is our mutual friend. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. You know, that really hurt to begin with because when you're hanging out with somebody and you've slept with them already, and then they tell you, and you're not getting along, and you're just trying to get through the couple of days together because you made a bad decision and you shouldn't have even been there anyway and then they tell you they're in love with your friend a person that you both know it hurts like my ego is hurt and because my ego was hurt I responded by telling him well that was really boring that's a really boring th reason to be an asshole which I still stand by that because it was a boring reason because I think the only reason he was saying that he was in love with this other girl was because he First of all, she's very beautiful, very cool. He has so much going on for her. But, like, he's not in a relationship with her. So, of course, like, he hasn't slept with her. She didn't sleep with him like the dummy I was, you know. So, of course, he's going to think, like, in his mind, he's going to have these, like, fantasies about what it would be like to be with her. And maybe someday they'll be together and they'll be very happily married and they'll, they'll be on the same wavelength. All I knew is, like, we weren't. So that pissed me off. And I... I I have this like fight or flight thing and I just at that moment I needed to get away from him. I knew we weren't going to the restaurant I wanted to go to 
And I just was like, I'm leaving. I want to never talk to you again. And he gave me his key and he was like, you know what he told me? It really hurt. Actually, I think I'm still healing from how much this hurt. But he said that I was old and dead in the eyes. And basically tossed his key to me. And I didn't, I, and I think I said, he's like young and young and stupid. We just like hurled some insults at each other. And he called, accused me of being like ageist or something, which I was being ageist. Like a 41 year old should not be hanging out with a 28 year old. That's a London actor, you know, because it titillates her and makes her feel like she's getting some of the arts and, and she's getting like this like adventurous adventure in London. I mean, that was stupid on my part and I knew it. I knew it. I don't know when I'm going to learn my lesson and just like go the, go the simple route of just like not saying yes, not saying yes to the invitation, not saying yes to the adventure, but I did because like I want to live. You know, I want to see. I wanted to go down that rabbit hole and see like maybe he was really telling me the truth when he said, when he said I'm really special and that he loves me. I think he actually said he loves me. And in this moment that we had had, the reason I even said yes was because we like had this beautiful moment where we just were kissing for so long. We were both so tired this one night and and frustrated because because it was at this film festival. It's so crazy, and we and I told them after this beautiful, probably hour of just like touching each other and kissing. We listened to we listened to Bob Marley, you know, not Bob Marley. I'm sorry. We listened to Bob Dylan, and he sang lyrics. I mean, it got very romantic, and I thought like maybe that's maybe we'll get a little bit. Maybe that was like a taste of things to come. You know, when I go visit him in London, maybe it'll be like this romantic thing. But like it wasn't. And I knew that it wasn't going to be that way. And so like in analyzing it, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I slept with him too quick. You know, I, I did on the first night that I stayed with him because we're just like laying in bed. I'm tired after traveling. And then he starts to touch me a little bit, you know. And then once you start to like touch somebody in a certain like places you know you get turned on and you're like oh and he, like my body just kind of turned a little like uh mushy like wanting it wanting like not not thinking straight not thinking like I wanted to play a game of holding out longer because I really want to make sure that he respects me and and knows you know more about me like we why did I just in that moment give in. I gave in because like my body was telling me I just wanted to give in. I just wanted to. And I wasn't looking to to play a certain like future game of maybe we'll be together. I don't even know if I like this guy. So holy shit. I can't even if you listen to that story and you're still with me, like kudos to you because my brain just it's the stream of consciousness sometimes. But like so many things happen in any moment. And and when like something, an interaction happens, something can change in like, something can change in a moment that changes everything. Like I remember, having, so the reason I have to kind of get so deep into these stories with the details is because like they all these little details matter. And I remember that there was a moment with a friend and the way she reacted to something that I said made me realize I couldn't trust her anymore and it changed the like whole dynamics of our friendship. And that's a whole other story. But, but like I, sometimes I think of like colors and the experiences we have, we, we try to talk to them, we try to like explain them in words, but we're so bound by the words. First of all, we're bound by the language and the nature of the language that we're using. I, I primarily communicate in English. There's things that I cannot say that aren't even wired into my brain because I didn't learn other languages as a kid really, really well. That people in Italian or French or Spanish or Arabic or like Chinese, all these other languages, like they can say concepts that they can relate, that are actually concepts that already exist in their mind because of the language that they grow up with. 
and it already exists in language, so therefore it exists in their mind, whereas in my English language, it doesn't even exist yet, so I don't even have words for it. And so going back to colors, like a, a, a thing can happen between two people, and it's expressed in words, which are basically just like sticks, you know, a letter is like a couple sticks that are put together a certain way. Symbols. But like it's not symbols, it's colors and it's water and it's moving. Like that's what the situation is. The situation is like vast and deep and it's not able to be communicated in words. So it all lives in here. And I think that that's why it's so hard sometimes to communicate in words. And I really am using this podcast to try to get better at it. So thank you for, for rolling with me on this story about, about, um, about London. So I'll fast forward now because I want to go back to like time and space. I'm in Kenya. It's about a month and a half later. That happened a month and a half ago. After that, I went to Portugal and I met two girls that came up to me after a statement that I had made in a breakout session about animal politics and how to create a world where it's a win-win for animals and people and nature. Environmental type um, a great, creating a great environment for everybody, right? That's what all these people were in Portugal trying to figure out. And I made a statement, and some for some reason, after I made the statement, the girls came to me and invited me to come to Denmark and work with them because we really connected in that moment. I said yes. There was no pay involved, but I was going to be able to stay with somebody and I would get some food. So I thought, okay, you know, that's better than I'm doing now. It's better than I'm doing now, so I'll, I'll take it. So I also met a woman that said, we'll come to Greece beforehand and we'll stay. And that story, if you want to hear about that, that's a whole other thing that happened. And that's in my podcast number two, where I actually filmed it in Greece. So after Greece, I went to Denmark and that's where I was last week. Okay, so I'm saying all this so you can know the lead up to where I am right now and what's kind of going on mentally with me right now. Um, I get to Denmark and I go to stay with this, you know, I was promised room and board. So I stayed with this wonderful couple. They're my age and they work with this party that I was there to help. So I, I go to their house and it is the epitome of order. I, I love being in orderly houses that are run by families because it's the opposite of me. And even though we're all the same age, they have set up their lives in, in an opposite way. They have jobs that they had jobs. The one guy left to run the political party, but they had jobs that paid them good money to do, do a job. And with that money, they were able to buy a place, buy things, you know, comforts that make the house run well. They have two grown kids, so I get to stay in a very nice room, and it's a little bit outside of the city. In being there, some things started to happen when I was there, and I started to kind of go into a little bit of a depression. And I started to feel really, really sad and, and panicking about the thought of even having conversations with anybody at this point. I did not want to be around people. I wanted to just sleep all day. I wanted to run away. So I'm going through this as I, as I just got to this new country. I got to this new job I'm supposed to be doing. And I, I call it the spiral down. I started to spiral down. So I'm in this really nice house, nice family. And then we go to the office and the way that the office is run is really orderly as well. But it also has people coming in and out of it and I don't really know what direction I'm going in when I'm there. I, I, I spent a couple of days learning about them. I wrote a script for a couple of videos and then I just started to, again, like my brain started to feel feel like this glaze come over it and I just got really really depressed 
and started, I'm sitting in the office, and there's probably like 10 people, you know, it's a small room, one room, and there's people everywhere all working on different projects, and it's a very collaborative spirit. I say it was run orderly, meaning like they have meetings and things like that, but it's also like all in one room, a lot of people because of, you know, we're an up and coming political party, there's not room to rent, obviously, like for everyone to have their own cube excuse me, cubicle and space to, space to be. So it's a new, like, startup in a way. So I started to panic. And somebody came over. I was writing a script, and one of the guys, he's very, very nice, came over and started, like, reading over my shoulder and started asking me questions about myself. And I, I gave him this, like, demon look. I was so mean in my response. And I said, please don't look over my shoulder you know I, well, I shouldn't have used the word demon I was I was just like really mad I was super irritable and and then I asked him not to read over my shoulder and then I just felt like the need again fight or flight like I had to get out of there so I just didn't say goodbye to anybody got my stuff and I checked into the hostel which is right up the road and then I never went back I sent them all messages, the, the key people that had invited me, and said, I'm going through this depression, and I can't be around people right now, which was actually very true. But I'm questioning, like, what the hell is going on with me? I got, I got really scared, thinking, is something, like, really, really wrong with the chemicals in my body? that I cannot be around other people, that an office setting like this is making me panic, that all these wonderful people that are trying to do like the best best work in the world, they're trying to, Denmark has so many pigs, six pigs to every person, and they're trapped in these tiny crates. They actually cannot even move around. Like, it's so awful the way that they're treated and they're trying to get freedom for the pigs and for all the animals and I like I love the work that they're doing and I was there I was supposed to be helping I was supposed to be making videos and building relationships with these beautiful people and here I am here I am like with my own selfish needs saying I'm depressed and I can't be a part of your group and Everybody was really gracious about it, although I felt like such a jerk. So I stayed at this hostel. I was, I didn't have a ticket, uh, a ticket like to leave until like seven days later. So I had seven more days at this hostel. So I decided to finish editing a movie that I started, and I met this guy that was a bartender from Chile. And he was pretty cool, 10 years younger than me, and he wanted to hang out a little bit. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go out with you a few times and, you know, we'll just have fun together. So that was cool. And we, we developed a friendship and went out, like, drinking. And he liked to smoke pot, so we smoked some pot. But, like, the pot was really affecting me negatively. And the fact that I'm in this room with all of these people that are coming in and out, and it was changing every day. So that's what I wanted to say. So hostels, like, I went, I went from this really nice domestic house, but I was feeling like I needed to get out on my own. And then I went to a hostel, and in order to pay the least amount possible, I rented this room that has eight beds in it. And... Talk about chaos. You're in chaos when you're in a hostel, but you're also in sweet chaos, which means you're like living. You're living because you're experiencing all of these people internationally and all these new perspectives. And it's like a little like grunge in a way. You know, like there it's it's not like the cleanest, most sterile environment, which I would call order. You know, maybe but like to get order you need money. Okay? So in order for people to have a house and a family and and cleanliness in their house, you know, you can be cleanly without money, but like to have like nice things and 
and a space that runs well, right? In order to even have the kids be able to have them go to a certain school or to have the education in your own self, you needed money probably to have have a little bit of order. So like it takes so I know like for example this this couple that I stayed with had very nice jobs before before the one started working full time in in activism. So like when you have a really nice job and you have extra money you're able to like buy storage containers and uh, set things up a certain way, have bookshelves, buy books. I, I, like, order is connected to money. I mean, and that's, their life in particular was probably like um, an outlier situation I'm explaining because they, they're doing it as right as could humanly be possible because they're also in a country that, that gives free education and is set up around, around order. Like Denmark... The people of Denmark have a, an, a great education starting when they're young that addresses logic and communication and the way that, like, the actual... Oh, they stay with their teacher, I was told. The same teacher will stay with the students throughout most of their... Ten years sometimes. I think it's changed recently, but that's the way that most people in Denmark grew up was with one teacher that stayed with them. So you really, like, if you get a great teacher and I think probably most of them are or were, um, you're really like building a relationship with them over time and they're able to go into the depth it takes in a certain subject rather than it just kind of being like this clinical type, oh, we learn math and this is math in a container and here's science, but they're not all integrated together in a way that makes the most sense for the human animal to process information. So, so let's see. So we're talking order and chaos is a theme. So it takes money to have order because think about it if you are homeless, right? You, you're in the epitome. That's like the epitome, the worst part of chaos. You're, you have bags. You're, you're walking around with plastic bags with all your stuff everywhere. You're living out of a suitcase. You don't have like an Ikea storage container space with like all of the hangers and your clothes that go here and you don't have a system for how you can set up your lunches because you don't have electricity which we have to pay for so you can't like go to the grocery store and buy all your meals and prep them using your vegetable spiralizer that makes the the dish taste really good so like order takes money chaos is is cheaper, right? But sometimes the sweet chaos can bring about adventure and a little bit of magic when you meet people from different cultures and like in a hostile setting. So I'm in a hostile setting, chaos, but I'm calling it sweet chaos because of the people I'm meeting and, um, but for example, like, I'm in this room and there's eight beds to it because I wanted to get the absolute cheapest room possible and it's in Denmark so you're not actually able to get a cheap room anywhere. So it's still costing, you know, 30 bucks a night, which is still kind of expensive, especially when you're traveling. Um, so I'm eight beds and I, I choose this room that's sort of, or this bed that's sort of in the corner and it had spatially, we can spatially make our, our rooms less chaotic and it had like a little bit of a wall on one side and a tiny little like um, partition here so I felt like I was a little safe in this corner and then they assigned different people to the room and so by by the weekend it's completely filled so there's eight people in this room and I'm feeling like oh my god I'm gonna panic again because there's too many people there's like strange smells some people talk to you some people don't all of our stuff is kind of everywhere so you're, you're kind of like in a way under the surface worried about your valuables but you can't worry too much because that's just the nature of a hostel and then the weekend ends so it's like Monday and most of the people leave except these two guys from China and spatially where they were in the room was really awkward to me because we're in bunk beds and there's all these other bunk beds but the one guy was above me and he kind of like stayed above me but he we didn't really talk I would say like 
I didn't make too much of an effort, but I could tell like he really wasn't wanting to be super social either. Plus they were like conversing amongst themselves. And it was the first time that I was in a mixed room, a mixed room with guys and girls. Usually it's just girls when I travel. So I was sort of like starting to get really annoyed because like there's all these empty beds and he could have just moved to a different bunk bed. He didn't have to be right underneath me in my safe space, right? Like because we have to feel emotionally safe where we're at. And when there's too many energies around me sometimes, I start to like, it, depending on who it is, I, I feel safe or unsafe. So I wasn't unsafe with these guys, but I was just like wanting to kind of be by myself. And I'm still spiraling down. I'm like having this glaze over my whole body that was super, super depressed. So I'm in this hostel, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward trying to like hang out with this bartender guy but wasn't into him so he was kind of making the moves a little bit I kissed him a few times made out and then we were we were in his bedroom one day and he was sharing a room with three other guys and like living there like a work trade agreement so he would just work for them but he'd also able to he was able to he was a bartender there at their bar but then he got free room and board but he's staying with two other people and I'm like I'm Again, going back to my age, I'm like, I'm 41. Why am I messing around with a guy that's 10 years older than me and in, like, a shared room in a hostel? Even though, like, I'm learning a lot from him. He's an inspiring DJ. He told me so much about music. And we were listening to music I'd never heard before. And then he was telling me about Chile and about uh, his family and his thoughts on on. I just like life and the things he'd been through. So I'm, I'm, I'm really connecting with him in, in a, like this raw, chaotic way because we're in a raw, chaotic environment. Whereas when we're in the orderly environment, I wasn't connecting with people in a raw, chaotic way because I'm in order. We're in business mode. We're in f- mode of domestic families and trajectories of life. And it's like wrapped up in a bow in a way although under the surface we're all still animals and we're we're all still like longing for raw chaos right but we force ourselves into order because that's how society keeps running so it's very there's like a, a rub between the two two ways of being and I find when I'm in order I long for raw chaos when I'm in raw chaos I long for a little bit of more order. And what, this is how I'm going to bring this back. In Jordan Peterson's book, The 12 Rules for Life, he says that this is what we are constantly trying to do is is walk the line between chaos and order. And the the, the critique I have of, of Jordan, and I'm only in chapter one, so he might address this, but I'm not quite sure, is that this is an antidote to chaos. He, he talks about a little bit about the chaos of life is when things get out of control and we start to um, lose our focus, we lose our self-esteem, we spiral down like I was spiraling down in a depression, we turn to alcohol and drugs. All of those things he is defining as chaos which I agree, those are byproducts of chaos. For example, uh, that's probably, those are byproducts of chaos, but they're not chaos in themselves. Chaos in itself is the raw, sweet chaos, in my opinion, of not being in the order of, of society, which tells us we need to be in a domestic situation we need a family because family is a way of ordering a life because in order to have a family you you need to have some kind of order around it you need to have a trajectory of okay we get married now and then we buy a house it's life script is what I've seen it talked about in in reddit so like I don't follow a life script I don't want to follow a life script I'm not interested in that I'm not interested in marriage in kids in in having things, in in working in an orderly office. I'm interested in the raw chaos of people. Like, who are you? The, what was what was happening 
in between me and the Chilean bartender that I was getting that I wasn't getting from the other people in Denmark. This is what this is why I, I what I was getting from Cinema de Mare as I'm sleeping on a floor interacting with people from all over the world apart from society. Okay, so it's like the raw chaos lives outside of the order of society and the life script and domestic life and family life. You have people that are trying to connect and understand each other, but like we can't stay there too long. When we stay in that spot too long, it starts to uh, not work with how society is set up. You know, and order takes money. So everybody's problem, usually in raw chaos, is there's not enough money because raw chaos cannot get funded well, you know, because it's not creating an output, a product for people. So so we have to live eight bunk beds to a room for as cheap as possible uh, versus having a good job and creating a safe space for a family and then going to an office and doing the society life thing. I don't, I don't know if that made sense. I really hope some of it did. I'm really trying to work these thoughts out in my head, and that's sort of what the idea of this podcast is, is stream of consciousness, the things I'm thinking about that have to do with what's normal and what is not. And... Um, I recommend this book. I think uh, I'm excited. I'm going to read some more of it today. But I would say we need to find a way. The challenge is we need to find a way to sustain ourselves for the people that don't want to follow the life script. The people like me, 41, single, not looking for kids, not looking for family, not looking to to work in a job where I'm exploited and have to create a product that people buy or a service that people have to, that people take part in that is taking from from the environment or the animals in some way because most things are doing that most most uh, if you work in a restaurant it's it's an animal restaurant even if you work in a vegan restaurant it's for like getting money you know I don't want to w- live in a world where I have to worry about making money, although that's like what the orderly way of society is. This is what we're working with. I want to live in the world where I'm connecting with people, connecting with bodies, understanding others. And I guess the only way to do that is to create art, and you still have to get money for your artwork. So there's a little bit of sellout there somewhere. Somewhere there's sellout. I was thinking of the sellout in the YouTube videos because I'm I'm Googling how to make money on YouTube. I really want to make money online so I can can follow raw chaos but also have a little bit of order in my life because you need money to create order. And, And I realize you do that through ads. Well, the ads, what are they? I don't know what Google AdSense is going to be putting before my video. Odds are, unless it's like some self-development life coach or a vegan company, even if it's like a vegan company, like I said, there a lot of them are just out for the money, but it's better than than harming animals. Like, what? where's the sellout? There's a sellout somewhere, and I'm going to also be a sellout because I'm going to take money from AdSense eventually, pushing, peddling, peddling products and things that probably, that create, that like have people part with their money. And I'm going to have to do that because you got to make money somehow. I have to check the camera again. That's so annoying. If anybody makes it this far in this ridiculous, (laughs) nonsensical stream of consciousness, podcast number three, um, you know, I like, you deserve, you deserve me to send you a cookie or a cupcake or something. Maybe I will. Maybe just tell me, Maggie, I got through your fucking rambling. It made sense to me. (laughs) No, don't lie. (sighs) Chemical reactions were chemical reactions. Um, I'm going to, well, I'll start to finish here a little bit, wrap it up a little bit. Um, Where do I want to go with this? I was real depressed in Denmark. 
didn't go back to my job there. Enjoyed some personal connections with people at the hostel. Edited a movie called Five Tricks of the Mind. I'd love for you to watch it. It's on my YouTube station. It's a movie I shot in Italy about the fluctuations of the mind and where, where we go when we meditate. I'm really proud of it, actually. You know, I want to bring more content into the world. I want to make movies. Uh, and then I started to feel better. I was sad for 10 days. And then I was researching, like, what's wrong with me chemically? What, why, what is happening? My family has asked me in the past if, if I'm bipolar. And I don't think that I am, but I don't know. I don't have all the symptoms of it, although I do have... I feel like anybody that's living in society that's like okay with the way that it goes down is is the crazy one. Like all the homeless bipolar people are probably the most logical people because this is not like okay what is going on. How we're basically born and needing to work and establish order to to just stay sane. You know, when we should be connecting with each other on an animal nature level. But we have to force ourselves to, to like, almost put a straight jacket on. Me and Aaron talk about that in the Christianity video. Like, it's like Christianity is a form of a straight jacket that you put on to be able to deal with the uncertainty of, of what's going on. And then, like... Maybe even family life is a straight jacket that you put on. It's like forced chaos, forced order on a chaotic animal world. Because like after all, we are one species. We're a biological species. And there's 8.7 billion species out there. Like we don't even know where we are. We think we're just like, oh, we're on a planet. We're human beings. We have animals. But we're like the ones running the show on this earth. Like we don't know. This... There could be like dimensions on dimensions on dimensions, you know, we, the earth could, who knows if like it's all a lie that it's even a planet. Maybe that was all made up. Maybe everybody's different than us and there's only like a few people out there that know the truth. I, I don't know. I do some weird conspiracy videos that you can watch with this guy, Zach, who's super smart and interesting. He was a bartender at a place I worked at and he's, he says he likes to talk about the flat earth theory that maybe uh, maybe we've been lied to for generation upon generation by the people with all the money that created actually education and books and science itself. And now that like, they're the, the tippy tippy top and they're the ones that are spewing the information to the rest of the people that are in the middle, like it's a pyramid. He calls them like the 30, 33 degree masons at the top. And then the, like there's a few degrees underneath them that that kind of really know what's happening, but then the rest of the people are just given so much information so it looks like it's true and they create like whole sciences around it, but it's really like, it's really so much a lie. I mean, you start going down that rabbit hole and you talk about thinking that you're going crazy. So I do a three hour interview with Zach and we kind of touch the surface of this, but then again, we're limited by words and you know, Zach's just one person saying this with his own research, and I, I'm new to a lot of the conspiracy theory stuff, and I don't know. And then in the end, I just have to survive. In the end, I'm one organism that, like, can't, that needs to keep enough order so she doesn't, like, end up in a mental hospital somewhere. So, <sighs> sorry about the buzz in the background. Um, I started researching this thing called PIDD, which is like basically premenstrual something, something disorder. It's like PMS on steroids. And it's a thing where you get really depressed every month before your period. And then when your period comes, you're fine. And I was kind of thinking back to my life to when I was like 16 and I first got my period. It was probably a few years before that. But I would, I remember this time when I first realized it, when I was going to church and I was working in the nursery downstairs and I had, I remember this day very vividly because I, it was the first time I actually recognized that something chemically was going wrong with me and I just started crying and crying and crying and crying and I felt like I'm in the pit of despair, the pit of despair 
And then I got my period about a week later. And I was in the pit of despair for a week. And I feel like in looking back on my life, depending on the month, some months are worse than others, but there's like a week or two that that I'm so sad. And I just chalk it up to like existential sadness, just like what being alive, trying to figure out all of this, trying to make my way in this crazy weird world that I don't understand and I'm scared in and I don't understand what other people are about and their intentions and like what's going on, what is an arm, you know, I start to spiral out. And then, so there's that. And then some months are fine, but like this particular month, um, and when my period came, it was like I had cramps really bad, I felt really bad, and it, it was worse than normal. Like my actual, like, actual menstrual cycle was worse than normal. And I thought, well, did I go through the depression beforehand that was worse than normal because of the period being worse than normal? And then I looked back to like chemically, again talking about us being chemical beings, a month before that, that was when all the, when I was in Italy sleeping on a floor in chaos. Okay, so when you're in chaos, you don't have a refrigerator, you don't have the money to buy the good food to prep ahead of time. So I'm like eating like shit, basically. Being vegan in Italy is, is basically means you drink beer, wine, potato chips, and, you know, bread. So that's no way to live. So I'm, I'm not really giving myself the nutrients I need and then I'm trying to make up for the chaos within the chaos lives alcohol more right so if I'm working in an office with a family and not even with a family if I'm working in a good job and like have order in my life I'm not drinking as much but with chaos comes drinking more so chemically did all this chaos build up as toxins in my system and create a really strong uh, reaction to uh, my period. Like, did, did all these chemicals and toxins and everything affect my body because of the, the way I was living the month before? And I, I asked myself that, you know, that that's something I'm thinking about right now. So, anyway, I'm going to wrap this up now because it's been so much. I'm exhausted myself. <laughs> I want to apologize to all the viewers. Uh, first of all, if again, if one person watched this and made it through the entire thing, please comment below. Um, you can say something mean because I'm annoyed with my own self. But I'm just trying to work out all these things in my own mind that I've been thinking about. It's sort of like the point of this this podcast. It's sharing a little bit like that. And I'm now in Kenya. I'm on to a different chapter. So basically what's going to be happening now is I'm going to be prepping for the next film festival, which is Cinema de Mare, but we're now in Kenya, Africa, for the first first time. So it's been going on 17 years in Italy, and it's the first year, and I'm working with a few wonderful people that I love and respect so, so very much. And I'm here to be close to them because they make me feel loved. They make me feel emotionally safe. I'm still living out of a suitcase. I'm still traveling. I'm still worried about what I'm going to do next. I'm still worried about how I'm going to make money. I'm still like spinning out in a lot of ways, but I'm with people that I love and I know love me. And I am working toward this event that's going to last a month and a half that I know really changes lives. And it creates a lot of creative projects and films that we put into the world, creates relationships. It, it's going to bring a hundred people from around the world to Kenya to experience this culture and make movies together that otherwise would not have come together. So it's something I believe in. It's something I'm excited about. At this point in my life, I can't do anything that I'm not really excited about. So please stay tuned. I'm going to, I'm going to, to, in order to establish some order in my life, I'm going to be living in a room by myself with my friend. I'm going to get really hyper-organized with my things and throw out the things that I don't need. I'm going to try to not live like with my stuff all over. I'm going to bring more yoga into my life, and I'm going to eat really healthy. And I'm going to try not to drink as much, even though I'm going to be with my friend Pinky, and we love to go out and dance and party. So those are just some things that I'm going to do to try to like not build up to the point where like next month when I get my period and I'm like the week before I don't want to like spiral down and have like a mental breakdown practically like I did last last week so that's just some stuff I'm working on and um I want to say you know what I want to say right now I want to say like pray for me I need it <laughs> residual Christianity but I do I do need your like 
love sent my way and I'm sending it your way. I don't know what you're going through, but we're all going through something. So, you know, I thought this, I'm gonna leave you with this. I was in the airport and I was really feeling bad and sad and scared and like, like I couldn't be around all these people, almost like in a panic. And like somebody smiled at me <laughs> in like a really genuine, nice way. And that smile changed my entire day. And I thought, I, it's all about just being kind to people. And, and you know, it's really funny. What happened right after that moment, I got in the wrong line at the airport and the girl told me I had to go over to another line and I was, I was so pissed <laughs> and I like gave her a hard time. I had to apologize to her later. I, had, I got the same girl when I went back in line. So like upon having this realization that it's just all about kindness and smiling, <laughs> I was mean to somebody, but I learned from it. And it was a big moment for me because I'm just trying to, in whatever I do next in my life, I just want to uh, bring about kindness and love and smiles. So if we could do one thing today, it's just smile at somebody, show kindness. And it really can change somebody's day completely. So I'm going to go now, get myself together, clean my room, <laughs> eat something healthy. And um, I love you guys. Thanks for the nice words. You know, you can say mean things too. I don't care. Uh, I care. I care. But I'm trying to just create a space where we can, you know, share. And I hope more people do podcasts. They're kind of fun to watch. You know, we can't always physically be in front of each other. But we can put this on our TVs now. YouTube is so easily, like, put on a television. And we can feel like we get to know each other. So I'm going to go now, smile at each other, be kind. And I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye.